The story is that his chickens had been going missing for quite a while. We've all had that. Could have been a fox, could have been a hyena, a wildcat, a gazelle, or something like that. <laughs> Maybe they'd been uh, sucked into the ground in some sort of underground vortex thing. Uh, gazelle. Notorious chicken thief, the gazelle. Anyway, the owner of the chickens, and sadly his name has been lost to history. Okay. Uh, put it out of his mind. Uh-huh. And he went back to his regular life. Do you know, my uh, father-in-law told me he has chickens, and whenever he gets a new dog, what you do is, because he lives what? on property, when you, you, you put the dog in a bag. Uh-huh. Then you take, Why? It, you take it in the chicken coop uh-huh. and, and you rough it up a little bit. And then you open the bag and it looks around and goes, holy shit, those chickens kicked the crap out of me and it never goes and kills the chickens. He's never tested that. I don't endorse this. The Holson no. Show doesn't endorse no, anything do to do with cruelty to animals. Nothing, and nothing. He, he claims he's never done it, just he heard about it. He heard about it. He heard about so it. the dog pops his head out of the bag and goes, oh, my God, these things are brutes. I'm not going <laughs> to go near them ever again. Look, I get it. I get yeah. it. Okay. So our friend, our friend, the, the chicken loser, uh, yeah, goes back to his life. He's eating food. He's going to work. Yep. And he's renovating his house. Um, but then one day in 1963, yeah. he apparently – Apparently. Supposedly. Saw a small chicken slip through a crack in his basement wall that had emerged during his renovation. The wall emerged or the chicken? The crack. The crack emerged and the a crack hadn't been there through. before. Oh. And the chicken went through and didn't come back. And he's like, what what in hell? And Frank the chicken. What in hell? Okay. Uh yeah. so he did what anyone would normally do. He goes down into his basement with a sledgehammer. And uh <laughs> and Takes to the wall to think, can I get the chicken out with my sledgehammer? Hits the wall with a sledgehammer, sledgehammer goes through like you wouldn't believe. He uh. thought it was hard rock, but it was not. <laughs> it was through to the other side. What a shock. <laughs> and behind the wall was a tunnel. Could you resist? No. You walk down the tunnel. Yeah. The tunnel leads to a second tunnel. The second tunnel leads to a third tunnel. And then eventually... <sighs> To an intricate system of rooms, houses, wells, ventilation shafts, stores, schools, churches, stables, and wineries. <laughs> it goes 18 stories deep beneath his tower, beneath the tower. All of this is underground. All of this is underground. 18 stories deep beneath the Turkish town uh, of Derinkuyu. This is a boyhood dream come true. Oh. Like, I found an underground invisible city. <laughs> no. I oh, know. I heard this story and uh, heart palpitations. Oh, the, idea, awesome. the idea that in your basement is oh. a door to a hidden oh. city. That's awesome. Yeah. 18 stories deep. It's got wineries. It's got schools. It's got uh, churches. It's got everything a community of 20,000 people would need to live for up to 3,000 years. Well, as in, like, they're still going to get food and stuff like that. But people had been living. That was going to be a question. People had been living in this town, this ancient city of Elengubu. People have been living there for 3,000 years. Um, That's crazy. From as far back as maybe 1200 um, BCE, so, you know, 3,000 years ago, all the way up until the 1920s. (laughs) And as as you guessed, like that story, that story makes me joyfully happy. Like the idea, as you said before, of discovering a hidden city underneath your house is just like why? You'd never see me again. So today, Uh, listener, I wanted to explore for you a variety of the tips and tricks for if you want to rediscover an ancient city. Welcome to The Wholesome Show. The podcast that explores the secret passageways and tunnels of the whole science. Thank you. I'm Will Grant. I'm uh, Roderick the Tunnel Borer Lambert. Tunnel Borer. So how would we find our cities of gold? I w- I'm going to do this as- Well, you'd get chickens. Yes, chickens. Aside from chickens, this is a lucky dip. You draw a, a method out of the hat, and I'll tell you about some hmm. some clown who used that method. Rummage, rummage, rummage. <laughs> Dynamite. Yeah, close. Dynamite. Dynamite. You sure it's not dynamite? Carry on. This guy, this this is a this is a sad story of discovery. I, I discovered. Look what I what bits of what I discovered. <laughs> Heinrich Schleiman mm. uh, grew up with a passion for the ancient. Jewish guy by any chance? No, Jew- I don't know. He's German. German. 
Uh, well, he lived. He grew up in Germany. Yeah, he was born in 1822, and he grew up listening to his corrupt Lutheran pastor uh, telling stories of like the ancient Greeks, like the the, the Odyssey and the Iliad. Oh yeah. Uh, by the age of seven or eight, he'd so fallen in love with all of these stories. He's like, "That's it. Yep. I'm going to be the one that finds Troy." Because Troy's been missing since lunchtime, and it we had. really want to find him. It had no one knew where Troy was. In fact, at the time, there was a huge debate whether Troy was sort of a mythical thing, like it's a, it, it's just a story, or if all of these events really happened. So it's real. Where else would Helen come from? <sighs> yeah, yeah. So, so people said no. Some people said yeah, it's mythical. Other people said look, it's real, but we have no idea where it is. So I didn't know Troy this was is the 19th century. I thought Troy was always considered no actual. No, no, no. It had fallen to the mists of time. I, I, Am I now the ignorant guy who doesn't realise it's been fake the whole time? Have I been fake news? <laughs> uh, but the path to discovery for Schleiman wasn't very easy. Oh. Uh, see, while his dad had paid for three years of good schooling, uh, I, said be- I said before he was corrupt and um, he was found embezzling church funds. And so... Was well, his dad the minister? His dad was the minister. Ah, the minister. Okay, okay, okay. And, and so everything fell apart at that mm. point. Um, so Schleiman himself got kicked out of uh, expensive school uh. and had to go to trade school. Uh, uh. Called in Germany the real school. Uh, at 14, he left that to become an apprentice in a grocery store. For the next 30 what years- What the fuck do you need to be an apprentice for to use a cash register? <laughs> Stack shelves. Probably. Look, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, what they mean is they low, had a low paid system. intern. Low paid intern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Um, in 20 years, you two can actually half manage the place. Okay. For the next 30 years, yep. he, he just worked in a variety of uh, good and bad sorts of schemes. Yep. Uh, he worked as a grocer's boy for a while uh, until he was lifting a hairy, heavy barrel and, uh, a hairy and barrel. that hurt him, so, hurt him so much that he coughed up blood. I don't know. Oh, damn. <laughs> you, you, it it must have been a heavy barrel. It was, have you ever lifted anything that afterwards you coughed up blood? Though? No, I have not. No, I have not. I mean, I've strained a thing or two, but the idea that you go, <laughs> oh, oh, wow, yeah. Uh, he worked as a cabin boy on the, the ship Dorothea until that was shipwrecked. And I think that was his first voyage. So he didn't want to do cabin boying anymore. He's, he's done, that's two boy jobs and neither of those sound like they don't have some problems <laughs> associated boy. with them. Grosses boy and cabin boy. Yeah, yeah. I think by that point he's no longer boy. Yeah, so the, rule, the rules are don't ever be anyone's <laughs> boy. <laughs> Probably not. All right, he became a messenger and an office attendant. Messenger boy? And then a bookkeeper boy uh, in Amsterdam. <laughs> so he's working his way up. The bookkeepers are the most notorious of the lot. So then he starts to get better ideas for business and he, he uh, becomes an import-export sort of person. Boy. In, he goes to Russia. Uh, Russian boy. Yeah, he sets up exporting, importing things in and out of Russia. He goes to America for a while. He, uh, um, he sets up a bank in America, shuffling gold around till the Rothschilds say, hey, you're, you're cooking the books. <laughs> Ours. He goes back to Russia and he's shuffling in all sorts of goods for the Crimean War, such as the things you need for ammunition. Anyway, well, this is all to say. Okay. By 44, he'd finally worked his way up through the, the corporate world, such as it was, to become a rich guy. Rich guy, teenager now rather than rich guy boy. Rich guy, rich guy, rich guy. 44. 44. So in 1866, at 44, he retires. He's made his money. Oh, shut up. That's just porn. He's made his money. There oh. you go. You should have made your money on saltpeter and sulfur and lead and, uh, and fake oh, gold. I tried, man, and no one would buy it. <laughs> and uh, he says, all right, that's it. I'm going back to finding Troy. All right. Uh, he enrolls as a mature age student first, university in Paris and then another university in Germany. Um, so it's either the Sorbonne or the Max Planck Institute for fucking anything. I know it's, it didn't exist then, but that's not the point. It's the Sorbonne. Yes, yep. he goes to the Sorbonne and then yep. the University of Rostock. Um, but then that's, that gives him enough cred that he's like, okay, let's go hunt for Troy. Okay. Basically at the time, there were three theories of where Troy could be, all of them in Turkey somewhere. Uh, it's in a town called um, Pinarabasi, uh, Hisalik, or another one called Troyas. Troyas sounds close. but Pinarabasi, Pisalik. And Rabas. Yeah, something like that. Now, look, the thing is, uh, I don't know why he chose the one that he did, but he just seems to have gone, all right, uh, this is the one. A guy named Frank Kelvert met him and said, look, it's it's at Hisselik. This is this is the thing. I think they might have found a few coins that looked Trojan. Troyish? They've got a picture of- That's, uh, a, that's a chick. It must a, be a Helen. A Hector or, or, a, or a horse. It's got a horse on it or something like that. <laughs> so they, they found they, they had found a few coins. And so um, Schleiman decided, all right, let's let's it's go there. dig up this mound, this mound thing at Hisselik. Got to be there. And uh, they started digging. But here's the problem. Because Schleiman, he had worked in munitions before. 
and he didn't want to go slowly with uh, his motivated man brushes and, uh, and, and brushes and, and blowing, or or even perhaps shovels and uh, a trowel. How about a trowel? He he might have done these things as well, but the problem is he he went he went straight to dynamite. Cool and um, cool 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 cool. He blew his way through nine layers of city. So his theory was- In one hit? No. I oh, not like he went hits. kaboom, boom, boom, boom. I think, oh, I think there's be- something here. Between 1870 and 1873, he just blew his way down with dynamite. Fuck, dude. All the way down. Now, his oh. theory was that um, ancient Troy of of the Iliad, of, of Hector and Priam and Helen and, and Paris, that was the bottom layer. So he was like, blow off all of That's it. what matters. It, Everything else is dross. <laughs> let's get, it's the freaking rind. I want the, the meat body. of this fruit. So- um, oh. On the day Dude. before they were, they were about to abandon the dig or stop the stop the exploding dig. Yeah, I think calling it a dig is un- – calling it the, the boom. <laughs> the explode. Yeah, yeah, we're off to do the boom. Uh, he did find a whole load of gold. Um, he called it Priam's treasure. Uh, and there's 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 photos of his wife at the time wearing wearing all of these necklaces. Bedecked. Bedecked in, in 3,000-year-old <laughs> necklaces. The problem was, of course, that when all of this was worked out and they worked out the layers and, yeah. and uh, the age of the jewellery and what it looks like, yeah. it was at least 1,000 years earlier than the Troy of the book. Oops. So so they'd gone into like a Bronze Age settlement. They'd found some cool stuff, but they had exploded and destroyed Actual Troy of the actual story. So, so he Troy. found it. He definitely found it, but he destroyed it. Here's a piece. Here's another piece. <laughs> it's somewhere. You fuckwit. You <laughs> fuckwit. Isn't that, isn't that, so, so here's the thing. Here's the lesson. We now know uh, exactly where ancient Troy was, where and, where Achilles and Hector fought, but we also know that we'll never see it because Schleiman blew it up. <laughs> Did I mention you fuck with? <laughs> oh, just a tiny little aside. I, I was thinking about this. Yeah. Trojan horse. Mm. Why is it called a Trojan horse? Who is invented it? it? Troj. No. No. Doctor Who? Oh, there's Odysseus that invented it. Anyway. Did it's, he? It's like, yeah, Odysseus or, or the Archeans. Anyway, anyway, the other side. The Trojans were the victims here yeah. of the Trojan horse. So this, they're respecting them. It's like calling uh, the atom bomb the Japanese bomb. It would be a little unfair. You don't call it that? I don't, and I don't think we should. Anyway, no Troy for you. All right, give me a new one. Fucking wanker. I mean, <laughs> fucking wanker. Old things tend to be brittle. Delicate. This makes it better for that me to run into around because I'm in a bad mood now. Follow the coins. All right, this is actually a, this is actually a pretty decent method for finding, uh, finding an ancient city. Metal detector on the beach. You could start there. I you, would. You could start there. Didn't and you ever say that? Did you, were you as a kid, did you ever watch people with a metal detector and think, oh, my God, the, only, the shit they must find? Only a million percent. Like oh, a, my, oh. me as a kid, I imagining literally under every beach is oh. 15% chance of, of pirate treasure. It, fucking gold mine. <laughs> and with that one I as well. I love that. I love that. There's, there's the treasure that's out there. I've, I've, got, a, I've got a little list of, of the treasure that is still out there that is just worth a lot. Is that what well, keeps you going at night? Like, I'm having a bad day at work. I'm going to look at the list. It's not. I would never be the, the weird person that becomes a treasure hunter, but it sounds so cool. Maybe between us we can work out a way to step over. We could do that. We could do that. <laughs> Bumbling treasure hunters. Yeah, fucking idiots. <laughs> Ho- relying on the most pe- – some people have stumbled on it by accident. <sighs> Premise. Alexander the Great invaded – Everywhere. A lot. A lot. Everywhere. It wasn't the biggest empire, but it's up there. It's bigger up than there. bigger than mine. You know, he stretched all the way from you know, Greece and Macedonia – Egypt, all the way to beyond Himalayas. Like he went, he went to North. Are, are they a long way apart? I, I don't. You don't do maps. I really don't know. There, all the way. I'm, to I'm not against them. All, all the way to there. I just don't have them in my head. Throughout his whole empire, he set up a whole bunch of cities and towns, and a whole bunch of them he called Alexandria. Why wouldn't you? That's why everywhere in America, because of your <laughs> exploits, it's called Williamsburg. <laughs> Or yeah, I, I just like the idea that you conquer and everywhere yeah. I call them all Rod. <laughs> I do. Every town I get into is this is Rod now. <laughs> Welcome to Rod. Actually, I think he did name at least one after his horse, which is nice. Buttercup. One city in particular yep. was- Alexandria? Uh, yes. It By was, any chance? Yeah, it was Alexandria beneath the mountains. Under under Zandria, I mean, it actually had two names. It's like, it's like Alexandria beneath the mountains. It's not an it's not an underground city. Oh. It's just up next to the mountains in the Hindu Kush, like the foot. Yeah, at the yeah. foothills of the Himalayas in the Hindu Kush. 
Hindu Kush? Yep. Hindu Kush. 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 Yep. Kush. Anyway, he set this yep. up in 329 BC. Yep. He left behind 3,000 of his men that sort of wanted to retire and tap out of the, the war game and just go from there. <laughs> 3,000. All right, off you go. Yeah, I think there was a bunch of locals as well. And they, they, they <sighs> yeah. The city thrived for centuries. Like it was a trading post yep. be between India and and heading to the west, you know, through Iran and, and over to Europe. I was just going to say Iran um, and Europe to the Had west. a thriving Buddhist Greek community. The obvious combination. Uh, yeah. Well, because there was the Greeks that stayed there. And so yeah, they stayed there and had and, and many of them became Buddhist. Um, Greek Buddhism time. is one of the lesser known um, but it happened. offshoots. Yeah, okay. it, it definitely happened. Yep. Uh, you know, a thousand years after Alexander, there's a Chinese traveller who wrote of it, saying that it had awesome fruit trees. I I was hoping he said, my God, there were so many gems and things here, but he said there was awesome fruit trees. And, the, and these buggers are so Buddhist, plus figs. Yeah. Okay. But then it was lost. I don't know what happens. I don't know Boys if, uh, you know, climate change, the sands of time or something like that. But the city faded from, mm. uh, faded from knowledge and faded a little bit from memory until the 18th or 19th century. When uh, the British start going, all right, Alexander came here. This is cool. Let's let's look for this stuff. I just realised as an Englishman that everything in the world is mine. They did. They did. All I have to do is look at it <laughs> and it's mine. Actually, actually, the guy who, who discovered it, uh, he, was, he was English, but he was also on the run from the English. He was a deserter from the East India Company. Oops. Faked his own death. Um, then he travelled around northern India and up into Afghanistan yeah. uh, for years and years as as a weird fraud, spy, uh, fake doctor, um, <laughs> potential king. There's a story about Why not? maybe him Why being not? offered a kingdom at some time. He, he wrote famous graffiti in, in really weird spots. Um, his name was Charles Mason. I, I like that you can be uh, a deserter from a company. I find that fascinating. Not I resigned. That was a different. Or didn't, I that, know. That was an odd company. It was, it was a very. It, it was a very different. It, sort it of was, I think, the world's first country uh, country company. So while he was on the run up in this area of Afghanistan, he was still fascinated by, by the idea. He they heard he heard the rumors that Alexander came through here. You know, where could it have been that his town was? And so he would always ask people, okay. "Are there any old tombs around here, or uh, any any old coins?" And for a long time, he didn't get any. But on the outskirts of Bagram, which is about 60 k's north of Kabul. You don't have to tell me. <laughs> Duh. He recovered a single ancient coin. Ooh. And um, it was brought out by a villager after threats and glares from his, uh, his uh, Afghan escort. So he'd, he'd go around and, and he'd ask villagers, anyone got any old coins? No. Anyone got any old coins? Have a look at this guy. <laughs> <laughs> I think there were some other times where there was a whole bunch of threats for the old coins. I'm not really sure. Yeah, I'm feeling like threats and glares might be downplaying what m really happened. It was it was common. Threats and glares were very common. But there may have been, you know, maybe a clattering of swords and, and you know. There was this cool time. There's a, there a good story of this guy, Charles Mason. He's 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 a weird character. <laughs> um, he escaped from some brigands who caught Fuck, him. Fuck, I love that word. Brigands. A brigand. <laughs> it's great. Because it sounds most lovely and terrible. He, they, they caught him in the night, but he had a whole bunch of opium on him, and so he stuffed their pipes so full of opium they couldn't even handle it, and they, they got so stoned and then they disappeared in the night. And I'm just like, good on you, man. That is cool. That's very clever. Anyway, once he'd found that old coin at Bagram and it had indications of – it had like a picture of Alexander on it, mm. and they're like, okay, and some Greek writing. They're like, okay, this is cool. And then he started asking for more. Uh, and villagers, dozens more coins popped out, procured with difficulty as their owners were suspicious of my motives in collecting them. Then, as word spread about amongst the villagers that the Ferengi, the foreigners, would actually pay for these battered pieces. Ferengi. That's where Star Trek got it from. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would actually pay for these battered pieces. First dozens, then hundreds, then thousands, until over the years that he stayed in Kabul, he amassed 68,000 ancient coins. Oh, my God. He sent them all back, as you can guess. To London, but the key thing is that they pointed directly to this area, like it's centered on where the ancient city was. Uh, he went and found some some ruins in this spot yeah. that is really quite clearly Alexandria and the Caucasus. You know what's cool about it, or not cool? Alexander probably built it in a strategically important location, yeah. and strategically important locations don't change. Don't they? No, because much, 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 much later, the Soviets also thought, you know, it's a good place for airbase. And the Americans also thought, yeah, it's You know, it's a great place for an airbase. <laughs> and so sitting underneath Bagram Air Base uh, is Alexandria in the Caucasus. Hidden underneath the runway is this ancient city. I was just like, come on, man. I'm sick of men wanting to have little boy slappy fights. And, and literally 
covering over ancient history. Come on, man. Come on. Yeah, fuck it. Oh, no, no. National security, man. All right, give me another one. Rummage, rummage, rummage. Leaning against a wall. I could do this. <laughs> it's got to be the right wall. It's got to be the right wall. It could be the wall that your chicken has escaped into, or it could be a wall in uh, Tel Mardik in Syria. Who hasn't lent on a wall in Tel Mardik in Syria, though? In the 1960s, mm. archaeologists thought the ancient world was still sort of, you know, separated into levels like Mesopotamia, you know, like like Iraq area, uh. and Egypt, and a- Anatolia, and, 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 and not much else was going on. They thought that that was that was the big spots of action. Not much else. And probably, okay, further afield there was China and things like that. But they didn't think <laughs> Rumor has it, they, okay. they didn't think very much was going on in between them. Okay. It's fair to say I've only been to one of those, the Anatolia bit, and there is shit everywhere. Uh, totally. Like totally. you walk down the street of any town in Turkey and there's an ancient awesome thing. I think I think that's the thing. Everywhere. Uh, that's the thing. You can see, and this is one of the things I've been thinking about in this podcast, mm. just because you can see a lot of monuments – doesn't mean pe- – or you can't see a lot of monuments, doesn't mean people weren't there. And, in no. fact, people could have been having vibrant societies yep. and maybe didn't want to build giant monuments. Maybe giant monuments are for assholes. Uh, anyway, um, so an Italian archaeologist, Paolo Matteo, decided that some mounds in Tel Madik in Syria might be worth investigating. Sure. So he's looking for somewhere else to, yeah, to go. Why not? Um, he's that kind of guy. He started digging in 1964, and by 1974, they had found a few things, a, a bunch of uh, cuneiform tablets mm. uh, lying in the ground. He's yeah, like, okay, something's going on here. And there is, there is clearly a mound. There's some sort of settlement going on. But the story goes that um, Matei's wife was visiting her husband at the site, and she apparently literally <laughs> leaned against a wall. Uh, that uh, that no one had thought to look at or deal with or, or dig in before, and the wall collapses, and it turns out it, it was just the the edge, the wall, the door, or something yeah, yeah. that was covered up of what turned out to be the world's oldest known library. So inside, what the in inside <laughs> they found chock a block of cuneiform tablets. Also, damn arranged in specific spots in the shelves with some sort of ordering system. No uh, way. I, 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 uh, I, I, that sort of, sh- it just is mind blowing. They could even find out from this. This is, this is the thing that, this is the thing that blows my mind. Uh, the tablets in there, there were enough in there that they could translate, yep. uh, could tell them the name of the city. So they realized Alexandria. it's Ebla. Uh, That's what I meant. <laughs> not an Alexandria. This no. is much before. But they could they could translate the name of the city and then they could work out uh, it was an empire. Um, the city itself was founded sort of in 5,500 years ago, developed into a trading empire, later into an expansionist power that covered a lot of northern Syria. Mm. It was built and destroyed like three times, and all of these records were kept in this library that was discovered. God, that's great. That is so good. Ah, ah. What the hell? Why do we do the things we did when we could have just done like Indiana Jones shit? I, I like I the, mean, the accidental Indiana Jones, like oh. that of, of falling through a wall or your chicken escapes into a crack. Oh, that's so good. I, I can't even imagine. And as a scholar, I think finding cool gold shit is awesome. Uh, like Charles Mason, the guy that whatever. discovered Alexandria in the Caucasus, he found gold. at another city he discovered, he found like like amazing gold. He found lots. Like some of these people find tra- – but but finding a library yeah. that tells you stuff, that is that is so cool. I'm going to hate myself right for saying this right now, but I'd rather find the library. I, I too. I think it's so awesome. Teenage me. I was going to say teenage me is horrified, but actually teenage me is going, yeah, me too. Fuck it. It's true. Give me another one. Rummage, rummage, rummage. Ah, magnetometer. Oh, magnetometer. All right, we're getting to some more modern methods now. So no longer just following Magnets. a chicken through the crack, following the coins or, or dynamiting. Following but- a chicken never goes out of style, though. That's not modern or ancient. That's just That just is. So <laughs> I do like to imagine it was a Benny Hill skit. Like- <laughs> Most things should be. <laughs> Helike was a Greek city mm. on the northern coast of the Peloponnesus. So that's the <laughs> – the lumpy peninsula bit of, Is that what of Greece. Peloponnesus means lumpy peninsula. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes. Flawless Greek. Mm-hmm. Founded in the Bronze Age, it rose to become the principal city of Archia, which were the the good guys in the Trojan War. One night, and this is this is just wild. Yeah. One night in the winter of three seventy three BCE. Three seventy three. Yep. That's when Aristotle was eleven years old. Plato was fifty one. I was just going to say both of those things. So they're around. They're yep. around. Yeah. Something bad happened. Mm. There's a couple of theories. The ancient account 
is that a few days before the disaster, imminent columns of flame appeared. Maybe earthquake lights? Pause for a second. Have you ever heard of earthquake lights? Pause for a second, yes, because I was going to say, what the fuck are earthquake lights? Like aurora borealis oh. that happen in the sky a little bit before an earthquake is about to happen. Don't always happen. What? But they do. What? Serious? Like, no, they, they have been documented for thousands of years. Really? And, and there is video and photo- photographic evidence of like an aurora borealis sort of phenomena. Swiftly before? Uh, or like months, days, minutes? I, I, I think it's in the days but it could be right before it could be happening. How the fuck have I not heard of that? I know, I know. And also, why isn't that the only thing they look at to predict earthquake? If it's, it's days- It's pretty cool. Because minutes, it's like, you know what? What time is it? 11.51? 11.53, is well, going to be an earthquake. Here's the other thing that is a nice earthquake predictor. Yeah. Uh, so this this is the ancient account. In, in the days before, we've got the earthquake lights yep. and all the animals and vermin buggered off. Well, you know that one. They all get tetchy and uh, twitchy. And then yeah, they, yeah, but I'd be spooked- I'm super spooked if if all of the vermin flee. I like You just don't like I, moving vermin though. You don't care whether they're <laughs> fleeing or coming towards you. It's all bad. I don't like moving vermin at all. Yeah, yes. Yeah. But, tr- but I, I just the idea all the animals are clearing out. I'm yeah, like, you're sitting on your deck, you're yeah, having a beer yeah. and a fat cigar as normal, and you see all these rats running away and you think, <laughs> I'm spooked. Yeah. I, 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 well, I'm staying here. Town is clean now. Obviously that's <laughs> yes. good. But rat, rats shouldn't run like that. Okay. And then the city and a space of 12 stadia. An, an area of distance. It, it converts area. into two kilometres. Sank into a poros and was covered over by the sea. All inhabitants perished without a trace. So that's the so ancient a- account. Atlantis, okay, cool. Um, they, they said that this was probably because um, Poseidon was cranky. Yeah, yeah. Um, because something, there was some story about some colonists of the city had gone somewhere else and said, hey, can we borrow your statue of Poseidon to make a replica? And the original said, no, we don't want to lend it. And then Poseidon's like, man, Dude, le- lend the freaking statue. There should be more of me. Anyway, town got destroyed. What a funny thing to do. Can we borrow your statue of Poseidon? And no. <laughs> <laughs> He's out of statue. Fuck you. I, I don't get A, A, why you borrow, but B, why you don't lend. It's like, you know. Surely there was a time when people knew how to draw. Yeah, can't draw three-dimensional. And statues, three-dimensional. Also, why don't why don't you bring your block of marble, sit it next it to the old statue and copy it there, then you ship it out? I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I know this because I've been a sculptor in my past. Shipping a block of marble and fucking it up, no big deal, get another block of marble. Sculpting it, making it beautiful, moving it back, boom. That's why the original, original guys Shouldn't are have like, moved. I don't want to move our Poseidon. You're right, you've talked me around. Our Poseidon is happy where he is here. No, he wasn't. Poseidon was like, no, I want to fucking have a new city over here. Modern accounts, building on this and building on some of the archaeological res- uh, um, evidence now, yep. reckon it was probably earthquake and tsunami or freaky earthquake and liquefaction. You know that thing where the earth shakes so much and the soil turns to Goo-goo. liquid and the town literally got sucked under. Of course oh, I know. Of course I know that thing. I mean. <laughs> there was there was video, video footage uh, in Christchurch of it and it just was that, freaks Jesus. me the fuck out. Like the ground not only shakes but literally turns to liquid. And uh, I just realised, you have made me realise how little I know about earthquakes or rather the things around them. I know earthquakes go boom and it's bad. Well, not boom, but yes. No, there's boom noises. I've been in one, but I didn't realise it was until- Both lights and liquid? Neither. Yeah. So it does happen. And and to have Fuck. your whole town sucked down by that. Good um, God. Anyway, for centuries, people debated about its location. Mm. Like like there's records in um, ancient Greek writers saying it existed and it's gone. Yeah. Uh, so where could it be? And you get people up in the 19th century and the 20th century uh, looking for it. Jacques Cousteau looked for it in the in the 20th century. No, he sent his brother in. Who's his brother? Philippe, I'm sending this – this is a very dangerous it's situation. Junior. I'm yeah. sending my brother Philippe down. <laughs> he, it, was, it was a known thing. He'd do it all the time. Did he? It was hilarious. He's always like, oh, this is a very dangerous situation full of many ham-head sharks. So I'm sending my brother Philippe. <laughs> he didn't say so, but it was deeply, deeply implied <laughs> – Anyway, well, fuck if I'm going down, I am Jacques. Jacques, <laughs> Jacques is a boss. Yeah, exactly. All the time, um, all the time. So most people accepted the tsunami idea, um, and and what they assumed okay. is is tsunami comes through, town gets washed out to sea, mm. and they took the the translation of a poros, uh, meaning that it, it went off the coast uh, into 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 the ocean, into the water, something like that. So that's fine. Uh, but the archaeologists, uh, Dora. Castanopoulou and Stephen Sota, they reread and they reckon, okay, there's another translation of, mm. of Porus and it's like inland lagoon. 
So it could have been sucked into an inland lagoon. Okay. Um, if the soil had liquefied like that, then maybe maybe that's what happened. So in 1994, uh, they carried out a magnetometer survey yeah. and started to find buried buildings. They found a Roman building in Delta. And then finally in 2001, they found the city of Helica using magnetometers to find uh, cobblestones, clay tiles, pottery, all sorts of stuff awesome. in an ancient lagoon near the village of Rosamolos. Awesome. There you go. This shit is awesome. Let's do this episode for two hours, four hours. Fuck it. You know, you know. I looked at the list of rediscovered cities, and there, there's a lot. I've got. I've, I, I'm doing seven for you. There this is are part so one of an eighty part. <laughs> well, actually, 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 there, there's a tiny bit I'll do at the end, and this is the bit that jazzes me. So anyway, give me the next one. That's the bit. Can we just go straight to that? I'm already jazzed. This shit is. This is crack. Listen to the locals. All right. I had to chuck this one in because this is this is one of the most famous stories of rediscovery okay. because, because it is one of the best looking uh, rediscovered cities in the world. Oh, we're going with attractiveness now. I like that. Oh, this is attractive because this is the city that you put up on top of a mountain. Do it's I? Machu Picchu. Did that get lost? Did that get lost? Yeah. It, well, kind of, kind of. Because people stop climbing. No. But um, – but, in Peru, the Inca civilization that had founded it, mm. uh, set it up, seems to have been possibly like a, the king's, uh, like a pleasure resort sort of thing. Like you go up on the top and you hang out there. Like I think it was it You yeah, have for a little king. rummage in the undies and eat something delicious. Yeah, I think it may have been one of the last places where Incas lived, but it originally set up as a sort of, that's where it's my my cool retreat, which it, it looks awesome. It's up on, on top of the mountain. Star Trek language, Risa, the pleasure planet. The two of you listening know who I'm not talking about. They know, they know. Oh, old Star Trek. <laughs> uh, in 1911, American yep. histogra- historian and explorer, Hiram Bingham, uh, he travelled to the Cusco region looking for the, an old Inca capital. Yep. There was the idea that there was something around. And he asked local villagers and they're like, all right, cool. So the local villager, Melacor Ateaga, said, yeah, I'll take you up to the top. Here's Machu Picchu. So Hiram, Hiram – But you've got to move as quickly as I do. Good luck with that, champ. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Hiram Bingham never really claimed to be the discoverer of Machu Picchu. He was he was the archaeologist who showed it to the rest of the world. Okay. You know, weary from hiking for hours, suddenly we found ourselves in the midst of a jungle-covered maze of small and large walls. Uh, surprise followed surprise until eventually there came the realisation they were in the midst of the most wonderful ruins as ever found in Peru. He, he took the first photos. I mean, this is 1911. Uh, so it, this so is not heaps of them. Yeah, not heaps. He took the first photos, wrote, wrote it up in Harper's, Harper's Bazaar, uh. and people back in America were like, whoa, this is, this is some cool stuff. He did a bunch more trips, clearing it out and, and showing what's there. That's he, awesome. he, he, he definitely claimed to, you know, show it to the rest of the world. Yeah. But – the locals knew. So he discovered there. it for white people. He just said, well, he didn't discover it for white people because when he got there, uh-huh. um, he found he found graffiti uh, from a guy named Agustin Lizarraga um, who'd written in, in charcoal, um, basically, I was here, 1902. So <laughs> so 10 years before, other, <laughs> other people had been there and there's, there's stories of other non-locals, so Germans going into the 19th century. People had been there a bunch of times. Um, All right. Bingham was the first to take a camera, but here's the thing. Okay. Asking the locals, maybe they already know it's there. That does make sense. Give me the last one. Last rummage. Satellites. Satellites? Satellites. I use one or the other. Oh, there you go. One or the other. Look, this is. I just had to put this in because rediscovery of cities has been mostly physical, but yeah. more and more and more, we're getting we're getting more settlements and cities and uh, archaeological things discovered by satellite. One of the first ones to do this. And so we should. Might have been um, a team that included uh, Ranulph Fiennes, the explorer, and a bunch of other people. Ray Fiennes' father. Yes. Yep. Um, used a bunch of NASA remote sensing satellites, uh, ground penetrating radar, Landsat, uh, s- photos from the um, Space Shuttle Challenger. Um, they they were looking for the lost city of Iram of the Pillars, somewhere on the Arabian Peninsula. I don't know much about it. It was an old trading post. Um, yep. and, and they found it using camel routes. So they could see underneath the underneath the desert using the, the ground penetrating radar and the, um, the Landsat program and stuff. You could see where these camel routes and they converge. So all of these- How could you see them? There was trails or there's like dead camels strewn along the way? I think trails. Like it's trails of, of compaction. So you can see a difference yeah. See a difference in the blown sand compared to, okay, they've been compacted. Because there's been so damn many for so yeah, damn long. Yeah, for thousands of years, camels and 
that People alone walking is mind towards, blowing. And, and I, lo- I love this That's idea wild. that hidden under there are sort of paths that no longer are visible to the eye, but they could see from space these camel trails all converging on a point. And that uh, is cool as hell. Ah. Uh, for me as well, it's like um, the, one of the other big ones. So there's there's a bunch more that are using all sorts of satellite images yeah. or LIDAR flying over the top of the jungle with yeah. a, a LIDAR plane. There's a, a city in, um, well, I want to say Mesoamerica. I, I think you should. <laughs> say it, man. I can't, remember, I can't remember if this one's in actually in Mexico or wherever. But anyway, mm. it's a Mayan city that um, would have had – they reckon up to a million people living in it. Damn. It's all been covered over by jungle and a lot has, has you know, decayed and come into ruins. Yeah, yeah. And there were, you know, there were some um, temples and things that still stood. So there was an idea, okay, there's something there. But they do these LIDAR images and they're like, oh, we can see houses, palaces, elevated highways, uh, all oh, sorts of different on. things, mapping these causeways. And it's just it's just mind-blowing what you can see. That shows how see. fucking arrogant we are about the past. Like, just- it breaks my brain. That might have been one of, if not the actual place where they started saying, you know, we weren't the first people to grand scale agriculture things. Massively. If we change our perspective, yeah. we can see a lot. So yeah. so I just want to give you, yeah. you know, if 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 you want to discover a hidden city. I do. There's a few out there that haven't been found. So there, there's this is just a short list. There's many more. Yeah. Cities that have been talked about in, mm. in writing. So uh, Atlantis, we, obviously. Uh, yeah, well. You tell me we found it. Well, some people reckon Helico is the, is the model for Atlantis. No, but I need to be better. Oh. <laughs> was there fancy technology? Like, was there Velcro there? If there wasn't Velcro, then it's not good enough. I like that you just want, well, A, Velcro, but B, fancy technology. They, if Atlantis existed, they weren't more advanced Come than Come on, rest. what a letdown. What a letdown. <laughs> we found Atlantis. It's some rock buildings in a puddle, and you're like, you're fucking kidding. It's roughly the same as all of the other Greek cities. Yeah. No, no. Atlantis, uh, we know, it was like Wakanda, only real. <laughs> okay, there's there's um, Ichitawa, uh, oh, yeah. which is, well, this would have been one of the capitals of the pharaoh uh, Menemhat in Egypt. Um, it was 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Uh, that hasn't been found. There's probably some there's probably in some Egypt. cool stuff there. So Egypt has not been properly lidared yet. Not properly. Yeah, mm. we could do that. Oh. Uh, Turquoise Mountain, an Afghan city described as the wonder of the world, but destroyed by Genghis Khan's son. That hasn't been found yet. Well, he had a lot to live up to and it didn't quite work, so he just broke shit. Akkad, the war capital of the Akkadian Empire, which ruled Mesopotamia over 4,000 years ago. There are many cities still out there. <sighs> there is much that beyond this. Like this is just the ones that are talked about. Yeah, they can there actually are plenty name, of yeah. other places that are still out there. So – so here's the tips. Here's if you want to find a city, a go gentle. Don't 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 blow it up. Don't blow it up. No. Don't don't destroy the city in your quest to get to the bottom there. Maybe work with the people who live there. You know, they they might have some ideas already. Yeah. You know, they might have some coins or they might actually know the city is there and and just work with them and say <laughs> I love, show it to I love that that's revelatory is like what if you ask the locals? You know, <laughs> I never thought of this. <laughs> just fucking ask someone. But, but you, also, know, you know the problem with that is almost all the explorers are men and we never ask directions. No. Why would you ask a direction? No, when you can just drive around in circles until you- just keep you, going. Then you'll find you, something. And if you don't, there's nothing to be fucking found. Every trip that I take, I use that how to get out of a maze strategy. Always take left-hand turns and eventually you'll get to your destination. Do you know the strategy I use? What? Someone tell me where to go. No. Ridiculous. No, I know. I know I have weaknesses. Well, one. Only one. No sense of direction. Can't and, do maps? And maps. All right. But the last one, yeah, and I think this is this is a this is one of the key points of as we shift in our thinking of archaeology mm. and and of ancient societies, mm. they might look different. They might be very different from how we might have imagined, and there might be a whole that, that we might not spot them from untrained eyes. And maybe people lived in very different ways. And what might be, you know, a super mega capital of awesome, yeah, may look a little bit different to bunch now. of tents or Atlantis, high tech, high tech. Open your mind.